Hi guys, welcome to our second lecture. Um, I'm, we're gonna get started right now. So, so today's lecture is on is Bitcoin to blockchain, um, from cypherpunks to J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, okay, and so to begin, why do we even do this history lecture? Um, it's really interesting, but that's that's not the whole explanation. Um, so when I first explained Bitcoin to someone, their first immediate response was, "Why don't you use something like Venmo then?" Um, because to them, like these two protocols kind of seem like they're both peer-to-peer, -peer, but they don't they didn't understand the underlying technology that went inside behind it. And so, while Bitcoin's decentralized, it's also slow, it's costly, and it's really redundant because you're always everyone keeps their own version of the blockchain. Um, so why would anyone want to use Bitcoin, much less develop Bitcoin? So today we're going to go through a lot of the motivations and ideologies that the people had when they first developed and created Bitcoin. So last week was a little bit about how Bitcoin works. Today is going to be more about um, why Bitcoin is the way it is today. So this is just a quick lecture overview. We'll talk about pre-Bitcoin. Um, and then we'll jump into early Bitcoin and like stuff that happened in the space around that time, scalability, scalability issues, and Ethereum. Uh, we'll dive into enterprise blockchain and talk about where we are now. And so before we start, we'll start off with this idea of li libertarian dreams. Um, and let me ask like a quick like rhetorical question: How much do you value your privacy? So. Um, I'll start off with a quote from the Cypherpunk Manifesto. Um, privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the world, whole world to know, but a secret matter is something the one some, something one doesn't want anyone to know. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. And so this is taken directly from the Cypherpunk Manifesto, which was written by a guy named Eric Hughes, who came out of Berkeley, so go Bears. Um, but this was a, this was like the idea behind the cypherpunk the cypherpunk movement where to them privacy was meant was very it was very important and especially in this information age where like data can be replicated um, it's harder to control who has access to data and whatnot and so we begin with these two groups cypherpunks and crypto anarchists um, these two groups were very libertarian um, and they advocated for the use of cryptography. Um, as a way to achieve social and like political change. Um, they were very concerned with um, privacy and they hated the fact that one, the government, the NSA was able to spy on people. Um, the military possessed a lot of the most advanced like cryptography technology at the time and they also really hated ideas like censorship. And so they also really hated big banks and like big large institutions that represented centralized um, power. And so they thought, we want something that's a little bit more anonymous, a financial system that lets us be private whenever we want to. And so cash is a relatively like anonymous, um, anonymous like currency that you can use today. It's really hard to trace back once you spend it. So if you give someone a dollar, it's really hard to say it came from this person or where, where it ends up. But in this digital era or this open society, it's really hard to become more anonymous. Um, a lot of our transactions happen online through like digital means. And so they viewed cryptography as a very important tool that would allow people to remain anonymous and stay private um, and selectively reveal themselves to the world. So in order to achieve this goal of anonymous financial system, they wanted to create a cryptocurrency. And so it's really important to note that they didn't just all of a sudden one day go like, hey, um, Gloria, let's create a cryptocurrency and just succeed right off the bat. There are a lot of like failed attempts at trying to create a cryptocurrency um, that really contributed to Bitcoin's um, core technologies. And so the first one we, can, we talk about is DigiCash. And so um, it was developed by a very smart like OG crypto wizard. His name was David Chaum. And he implemented um, the idea of blind signatures. And so 
this was uh, built off of the idea of public key and private key cryptography. And what it said was it allowed people to reveal nothing about themselves, but still be able to consistently sign off on transactions and authenticate that um, transactions were actually coming <coughs> from you. The big problem with uh, hash or Digicash was that um, it, it was his own company that David Chan was running, and so it was centralized. We're introducing like a central point of failure, um, and when the company went down, as in like it went bankrupt, the 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 currency also went down with it, and so this wasn't a very reliable system, and so people decided that if we don't want to introduce like a central point of failure, we want something that's decentralized or distributed. So the next um, logical uh, jump was um, hash cash. So currencies need to be somewhat trustworthy and scarce. Um, a natural solution to do this is in our current model, in our current financial system, we have the Federal Reserve or like banks mint and produce um, currency to vouch and um, vouch for its value and now in, into the future. And so hash cash uh, tackled this idea in a little bit of a decentralized manner where instead of having a centralized source like mint coins for you um, it stated let's use like a cryptographic hash function to really to and solve a puzzle using this like cryptographic hash um, and what what this really means is that it stated that coins can only be minted when you expend some sort of resource like um, computational power and does this sound familiar to any of you guys? Sounds like proof of work, right? So um, a quick fun fact about Hashcash was that it was originally designed as like a mechanism to um, prevent email and limit to prevent and limit email spam. Um, this way, you could tie down a resource such as like computational power or time, um, so that it would make spamming or DDoS more expensive. So it says like, hey, before you send out this next email, I want you to solve this puzzle or do this computation before you can send out this email. And so it makes it uneconomical to send out spam and do malicious activity. And our third like major attempt is um, B money. So B money was proposed by this guy on the right here, um, Wei Dai. So he read the Cypherpunk Manifesto um, and he really resonated with a lot of the ideologies um, that the cypher, cypherpunk uh, movement stated. And he came up with two main ideas that helped, um, I guess, enable decentralized cryptocurrencies. So the first one was he, he created a way or protocol to enforce contractual agreements between parties or anonymous parties by broadcasting their communication to the network. And second, he proposed an idea of a protocol where everyone maintains like their own database, where everyone keeps track of all the balances of every other user. And this kind of is very similar to what, uh, what blockchains use nowadays, where everyone holds their own copy of the blockchain. Yes? Um, can you repeat that question one more time? So, so the, his main idea, it was very simple as it was a way to just, just broadcast whatever um, transaction you have with the entire network. It's just a naive approach at, at, at best, um, but that was what he stated. And then having a, a ledger on your part, like a database, to, um, to keep track of records for everyone else on the network. And so all of these ideas were really combined together and implemented into Bitcoin. And so on the fateful day of like October 2008, um, this guy or girl or a group of people, we don't really know because um, Satoshi Nakamoto is just a pseudonym. Someone by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto releases a white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And in it, he addressed the need for trust and he identified it as a problem of sorts and why you can't really implement that um, or easily have that in a decentralized or distributed network. But the way that he proposes to solve this problem was that he introduces proof of work, which we introduced last week, 
as its decentralized consensus algorithm, which ensured that the idea of one CPU, one vote, to one counter um, Sybil attacks, also to counter um, double spending, basically. And also, this in this paper, he really echoed a lot of the language and used by the cypherpunks, and he showed that he was also somewhat re a contributed contributing to like the libertarian roots of um, and their attempts at creating a viable cryptocurrency. And so he put all these ideas together, signing Hashcash and B Money specifically, um, and he talks about incentives, um, why people would use Bitcoin, why they would they would mine Bitcoin in this white paper. But at the time when he first released it, a lot of people didn't really notice it. They didn't really care for it, and he also had a lot of critics for um, about his white paper, saying that it wouldn't work. Or um, yeah, and so, but he did have a few supporters. Some people read it and were, were like, "This is very interesting. Let's try it out." So one of the uh, early developers of Bitcoin, Hal Finney, um, and Satoshi Nakamoto started working together and developing Bitcoin. And so two months later. In January, the genesis block of the genesis block of Bitcoin was mined, and in that block, it references it references an article in the the London Times or the Times of London actually, um, saying involving the the Chancellor bailing out the banks. Um, this was an event that really pissed off a lot of the libertarians, as it showed like an abuse of power of governments, and it, this also references or it winks. At um, Bitcoin's like libertarian roots, and so as more and more people kind of join the network and start mining, it Bitcoin doesn't really have some real intrinsic value at the moment. Right now, it's just a bunch of CS nerds who read it, who found it on like forums online, or cypherpunks who believe in the cryptocurrency, and so. There's a guy named uh, Laszlo Hanyas, and he plays video games. And so he realizes that not only is his like computer and his graphics card really, really useful for playing games, or it's also very like, good at solving the Bitcoin mining puzzle. And so he starts to mine Bitcoins, um, and he accumulates. He easily accumulates a bunch of Bitcoins. There, it wasn't very difficult to mine cryptocurrency at this time, and so he was getting like thousands and thousands of bitcoins every day. So he's sitting on like a, a huge pile of bitcoin, and he and Satoshi kind of realize it doesn't really like do much good for the network if one person just controls all the mining or dominates the mining. So, but Laszlo is very much interested in seeing where um, bitcoin's potential to grow, and so. He posts on a Bitcoin for Bitcoin forum saying, "I'll pay uh, ten thousand bitcoins for a couple of pizzas," and so this is the iconic post that he posts in um, Bitcoin Talk. And today we see this as like a sixty-four million dollar pizza that he paid for. Um, <laughs> last semester it was like eighty-seven million, and in previous semesters it was a bit lower. But we can see that like the prices of Bitcoin really change frequently. But it's very easy to get caught up and say, oh, poor guy. Um, he, he probably didn't know that Bitcoin was going to have so much value and utility and just accidentally gave it away, right? But that's actually the contrary. Um, we believe, he believed that Bitcoin would have value in the future, and he wanted to see it grow. So he was the initial like kicking or like starting point, and he created the first Bitcoin transaction that exchanged Bitcoin, which at the time was some like magic internet money, for something of real intrinsic value, like pizza. You can eat pizza and just not go hungry, right? So he knew that the Bitcoin ecosystem needed to be built up some way or another, and he helped contribute to that by giving up some of his own. And another fun fact, um, when we talk about, like in later lectures, the Lightning Network, um, Laszlo was also one of the very first users to actually buy a pizza using a Lightning transaction, which is really cool too. Um, and so, this is the piece, or this is the actual pizza that he got. Um, he said, "I wanted to report that I successfully traded ten thousand bitcoins for pizza," and that's like his little kid. 
looking at the Papa John's pizza. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so I, the, the main reason for proof of work is um, the real like in, genius concept that was actually like introduced in proof of work is that instead of um, it ties down your voting power per se in the network to some finite resource. Originally, if you were to tie it down to something like identity, like in a normal setting where you have like people, um, that's fine. But in the Bitcoin network where it's really easy to generate multiple accounts because there's no barrier to entry, you need to tie down um, like your voting power to something that's finite or and scarce. And at the time, like the most, I guess, the, the, the most accessible resource that you can like do is computational resource, like computing power. And so... Satoshi Nakamoto uses, okay, we'll use this like computational power to, to um, limit um, our voting power, basically. And he cites this basically from the, the early attempt of Hashcash, because that's what they use to like limit spam in um, email networks and stuff like that. And also, in, in, in our current stage, um, the proof of work algorithm also provides like security for the Bitcoin network because of the sheer amount of people um, on the network, it basically deters anyone from trying to overtake the current network. That's one of the reasons now, but the main reason is that you want to tie, um, you want to tie your like voting power or the ability to like generate blocks um, to something that's finite. So this was probably around like before, the, like so I guess like crypto cryptography um, started to like really emerge and become more prevalent around like the seventies, and so the timeline for around um, hash cash view cash that was probably in the like nineteen nineties around, and so I'm yeah 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 it it was only in two thousand eight when Bitcoin actually like the cypherpunk movement also started like very early on but it didn't take it didn't take um, it took a while for things to actually like develop and okay so moving on to the next section um, so Bitcoin starts to gain a lot of popularity um, a lot of people start wanting to join the network um, and use their coins to transact with but of course um, Bitcoin at attracts both positive and negative attention and around this time, it's really hard to get Bitcoins. You either have to start mining Bitcoins yourself, or you have to <laughs> have someone basically give it to you or send it to you, right? And so exchanges start popping up, and most notably is Mt. Gox, um, which was started back in 2010 by a guy named Jed, Jed McCaleb. So Jed is, um, he's a gamer. He plays this training card game called Mt. Gox, or not Mt. Gox, Magic the Gathering. And so he creates this original website for um, to trade and trade the cards like stocks. It didn't work out, and so he was just browsing um, news articles, and he, found, he finds out about Bitcoin on Slashdot. And so he decides to like, use that like, domain name as a exchange for the community. And so fast forward a few years, big, um, Mt. Gox becomes one of the biggest online exchanges um, for Bitcoin and at its peak in 2014 it handles approximately 70 percent of all the transactions in the network and if you remember back to um, when Gloria was talking last week if you she mentioned that your Bitcoins are inherently tied to a private key um, that's how you send transactions and how you prove ownership of that Bitcoin and so if you lose your private key you lose all your Bitcoins essentially and that's just a natural problem um, and disadvantage of the Bitcoin system. 
But the problem is of having a an exchange handle a large amount of transactions. Um, you're introducing some form of centralization and a central point of failure. And so Mt. Gox, while it's handling 70% of the transactions, um, if a hacker gets into Mt. Gox, um, he can do a lot of damage. And so that's one of the things that happened in 2014 where Mt. Gox just notices that it's some of some amount of Bitcoins, like 750,000 Bitcoins, just disappeared in their books. And so because of that, they had to like declare bankruptcy. And at the time, it was a huge scandal and prices of Bitcoin kind of tanked. Um, another event I want to highlight is Silk Road. Um, in 2017, or 2011, sorry, my bad, I'm reading dates all wrong. Um, this guy named Ross Ulbricht um, is cooking up some shrooms in his house apartment and he wants to open up this like anonymous um, eBay of drugs, right? And so when you can, yeah. And so he uses Tor and um, to handle the the an anonymization of network traffic and uses Bitcoin as like the pay the on anonymous form of payment. And so um, this made Bitcoin really popular because one, it's like the killer use case for Bitcoin at the time because. At the time, there's no way to really identify who you are. There's no KYC laws around around Bitcoin, so people who are sending um, Bitcoin back and forth on these like shady markets couldn't be really identified. Um, but then, after a few years, the FBI uh, catches on. Um, they find who um, who Ross Ulbricht is, um, and he's put in jail. Um, they they shut down uh, Silk Road and seize $3.5 million in Bitcoin. This is just another one of the scandals that really made Bitcoin like take a few hits, but it also put it up in like, the headlines. And so this is just a graph of um, like a month from November 1st to November 30th of like 2013. It starts off from like 200 and it goes all the way to 1,000. Um, there's like a lot of reasons for like why this may have happened. Um, one of the reasons is like Chinese investors, their speculation drove prices up. But then also around this time, this was this was just before um, Mt. Gox kind of like declared bankruptcy. Um, there were, um, I guess, theories of like automated bots driving up prices in um, in Mt. Gox. So it's just wild that in one month it can go up so high. And also, if you noticed recently too, um, like in the past like year or so, Bitcoin has like gone up crazy, but it also come crashing down. Um, and around this time, there's a lot of altcoins that appear um, that want to kind of emulate um, Bitcoin. And so there's projects like Litecoin, which is essentially a fork of Bitcoin. Um, they try to be the, the silver to like Bitcoin's gold. There's uh, more anonymous. Um, there's more anonymous altcoins out there too, like Zcash, which uses like um, zero knowledge proofs, um, and like Monero, which uses ring signatures to like mask um, aspects of a transaction. And there's also inter there's Stellar and Ripple, which um, pioneered like more different ways to come to agreement, different ways of consensus that eliminated the need for using electricity to um, solve like cryptographic hash puzzles and then there's memes that come up like dogecoin <laughs> and so around this time like 2014 is probably one of one of its previous peaks it, it starts to hit a lot of headlines um one mount gox like loses a lot of bitcoin and around this time people start realizing that they don't really know who satoshi nakamoto is and they and they go they start going on like this wild witch hunt for this anonymous identity and they fail. Um, some VCs um, start speculating and also merchants start um, accepting Bitcoin um, around this time too. Like Overstock, one of the major retailers, um, accept Bitcoin. And there's also one as a example on the bottom where you can buy like horse poop and send it to. Uh, someone you don't like. <laughs>
And around this time, a lot of startups start to pop up too. Um, Coinbase, does anybody, have, has anybody used Coinbase before? A lot of people. They're still one of like the biggest um, players in the space right now. Um, there's a bunch of companies like Zappo, which is a wallet, um, blockchain.info, which is a block explorer, so you can explore the history of transactions, basically explore the entire ledger. Um, and then a lot of VC firms like Adreesen Horowitz, Blockchain Capital, Pantera. Adreesen Horowitz is still one of like the major investors in the crypto space currently too. They have like a crypto fund, which is dedicated to just invest in crypto projects. And yeah, so it gains a lot of like kind of adoption around this time too. And after a while, after like the bubble kind of bursts and it goes back down to its like original like price of like of 200 and it stays in the slump for like over a year. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. There's a lot of scandals that have happened that kind of brought this and a lot of regulation that started to occur. Um, the Chinese government started saying, saying that, oh, they want to regulate Bitcoin, and that may have contributed to some of this. Any questions? Yeah. Can you talk about how like, uh, the Bitcoin wallet is not really operating in the scale like it should be? So, uh, uh, so um, what they were looking at was they were looking at alternate forms of consensus, not proof of work. And so what they, they looked at was some, something called Federated Byzantine Agreements. Um, we'll get into that in a later lecture. Um, we'll talk about it more in depth. I have like a pretty good graphic on how it works. Um, and yeah, if you stay for like, I guess it's like lecture six or seven or something like that, it'll, you'll, we'll, I'll explain it more in depth. Yeah. Mount Gox? Yeah, basically it's an exchange where you can exchange fiat money for cryptocurrency. And it basically it, it acts as like a gateway for just normal people to get Bitcoin besides having it being sent to them or mining it themselves. Yeah. And like, why is it called Mt. Gox? It's called Mt. Gox because it's called Magic the Gathering online exchange. That was the original name for it. Um, but his venture failed and so he started it uh, a cryptocurrency exchange on top of that domain. So what Mt. Gox is similar to Mt. Gox? Mm, no, not a, it, it's not a share or you you basically pay for a Bitcoin or like some amount of it. Um, you're actually owning that. It's stored it's technically stored on their like in their like wallet on the exchange. That's why one of that was one of the reasons why it kind of failed because if you're storing um, crypto on an exchange, it's it's controlled by the exchange, not by you. And yeah. I mean. One of the reasons, um, I can't really comment, this is a lot of various reasons, but one of the reasons can be that it's one of the very first ones. It's proven itself for the longest time to be, sta like, not stable, but, like, secure at least. Um, a lot of it is driven by, like, speculation. You can see around, like, the time of, like, last winter, um, there was a lot of speculation in the space. That's why prices were driven up so high. Um, like when, a lot of the hype has kind of died down since then and I feel like it's the market kind of regulating itself as in it's a lot of the people who aren't in it for like monetary motives are out of the space and it's really people who are interested in where blockchain has to offer for the future. Um, so, I mean, 
if we go to this slide, Pure Coin is one of the very first cryptocurrencies to actually introduce another um, consensus algorithm that's not proof of work, which is they pioneered kind of proof of stake. Where, so in a, in in proof of work, where you tied your resource, uh, your your voting power to the finite resource of computing power, they're tying it to the assets that you hold in that cryptocurrency. And so they were one of the very first cryptocurrencies to introduce that idea. And I think that's also like kind of one of the driving factors for proof of stake to be adopted now. Um, there's a lot of other alternate forms of um, consensus models right now um, that haven't maybe proven it themselves yet, but um, we can, we'll talk about that in the alternate consensus lecture and you'll learn more about the different types of but Peercoin is an example of a cryptocurrency that did try to use non-proof of work in their cryptocurrency. Yes. Um, so we have a reading, uh, like a take-home reading after this, that kind of explains why. Um, it was mainly like um, just them. Like, it was just bad practices on Mt. Gox's part. They weren't noticing what was happening in their logs. Um, and so there's actually two major scandals that happened with Mt. Gox, not just the, the money disappearing, but also the fact that um, there was some sort of like automated trading bots that were involved in Mt. Gox. Okay, I'll move on. So we're t we'll talk a little bit about scalability debates. So around this time when Bitcoin is a little bit more in the headlines, people start to use Bitcoin. Um, this is around the time where Bitcoin hits its limit of its like network capacity or like scale in, in terms of scalability. And so, um, so the scalability or the, the block size debate at this time is in 2015, um, a lot of the the transactions in the in the network kind of go unconfirmed because the blocks the blocks that contain all these transactions start to run out of space. There's more transactions um, that happen in a in a time span than than the network can accommodate, and so a bunch of transactions start to go unconfirmed. And so around this time, people start wondering how do we actually fix this? Um, this led to proposals like Bitcoin XT, uh, Bitcoin Classic. A segregated witness um, now it's called segregated witness 2x um, to try to improve the networks like transaction processing like capacity and some of the proposals rely on either changing the the size of the block so instead of only holding one megabyte of transactions holding more or inherently modifying the protocols of the Bitcoin um, like client and so each of these solutions have like pros and cons and I won't dive into them in too much detail, but it raised a question on how do we how, how do we come to some sort of like um, decentralized way of changing our protocol? So decentralized governance. Um, there was no mechanism to account for this type of um, like protocol changes. Um, so one way that people kind of tried to propose changes for the Bitcoin um, system was by introducing proposals called BIPs. And these are called Bitcoin Improvement Protocols. And outside the Bitcoin network on like forums and just public chat areas, they would um, propose some sort of BIP and gain approval from either miners and stuff like that. Um, but the idea was that it was very difficult to, I guess, it was very difficult to, to come to an agreement on how to change Bitcoin as a protocol because that itself wasn't coded in into its like code basically. And so around this time too, um, Ethereum kind of emerges. Um, Bitcoin was created as essentially a like, coin centric kind of cryptocurrency. It's focused on being a store of value and a value transfer kind of system where you can send transactions back and forth. Ethereum came about because um, people were, they, they wanted to, um, I guess, create a cryptocurrency that, 
or create a platform actually that would be able to tolerate um, like Turing complete um, code. Um, also support peer-to-peer -peer smart contracts basically. Um, so in Turing complete languages, anything that you can write up on like a computer, you can do in Ethereum. And so this code execution for this Ethereum platform um, is done by, is fueled by this inherent cryptocurrency called Ether. Um, it was originally described as a, um, in a white paper by a 19 year old called Vitalik Buterin, who was um, studying computer science at University of Waterloo. Um, he originally had the idea and actually proposed it in the Bitcoin community, but because the Bitcoin community is so conservative and um, kind of rejected his changes, he went on off on his own to like, I guess, develop Ethereum as like a completely different project. And so around July, between July and August of 2014, um, Ethereum has a crowd sale and they raise around seven, wait, they sell 7.4 million Ether for around 3,700 3, Bitcoin. And at this time, it's equivalent to like $2.3 million. Um, and in July of 2015, the Ethereum blockchain finally um, is released to the public. Um, it went live and fast forward another year, the value of all the Ethereum tokens um, on its blockchain is worth more than like a billion dollars. And so also around this time, the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization was becoming really popular. It's essentially a program that lives on the Ethereum blockchain that creates some sort of distributed government model. Um, the DAO specifically, called the DAO, um, was a specialized project that would serve as like a decentralized venture capital firm, and which would allow investors to vote on distribution of funds between startups. But in 2016, a hacker noticed a bug in the smart contract or the code of the DAO, and stole about $120 million worth of Ether um, from the smart contract. And so at this time, this was huge. This was like 10% of all the tokens that were on the Ether in the network. And so the community was outraged. One, so they were also very divided. Half of the community really wanted to like undo that, that process. They wanted to ignore that this DAO contract was ever hacked, so they ignored that um, like series of blocks and they reverted back to a certain point in, in their timeline where that never happened. But also some of them were very focused on, were also very conservative minded and they didn't want to undo the hack because their, their belief was that whatever was executed on this, uh, the Ethereum blockchain was, the code was law basically. And this split in Ethereum basically generate two sides of Ethereum, one called Ethereum Classic where the, the DAO actually did get hacked, and um, one where another history, just the Ethereum that we consider today as the, the main Ethereum DAO. And so this was a, like a really catastrophic event that really kind of divided the community too. Um, and this is just a reminder of how like distributed kind of like governance is kind of difficult. Um, people can't really easily come to an agreement um, especially when they're very, they have extreme opinions or on either side of the fence. And so around from like 2016 to the present, we see a lot of regulation happening. So after the, after this DAO hack, everyone was very unsure about what would happen. How would the SEC like rule on this fiasco? Um, they didn't rule on this like thing until like very later on either. Um, and around this time, uh, people start uh, noticing like, I guess, ways to make money in the space. So ICOs, like initial coin offerings. So um, this very similar to the way that Ethereum originally um, made its initial capital to start creating Ethereum, companies start realizing that, or crypto projects start realizing they can do that too and raise capital in, in a non-traditional sense. And so also people start speculating and they don't want to miss out on like this next Bitcoin, which was really valuable. And so prices start going up and up and up. And we see like some sort of like 
crash kind of where like Ethereum, um, there's like instability in the market. One, because of like political circumstances, um, but there's also just a bunch of speculation in the space. Like prices of Bitcoin get broadcast on the radio. Everyone knows like the term Bitcoin and becomes so, sort of buzzword that really it stays like as like a household name and people start investing or not investing just because of the fact that they know the name. And so this is very dangerous in this, in, in this ecosystem. And so it leads to some sort of like crash. And we also see a bunch of like memes pop out of the space. This is memes that have popped up in our UC Berkeley meme for ID teens page, um, which I think are really funny. Any questions? Mm -hmm. I don't want to get too much in depth. Um, you can probably look it up um, on your own, but I'll explain it at like a very high level. Um, what exactly was the hack was um, they exploited something called a re-entrancy attack. Re-entrancy re attack where they were able to drain funds. They were able to keep calling um, a particular function in the smart contract that would continually drain funds um, from this their pool of like funds. And then this was done in a way where like they didn't actually um, do any of any sort of accounting before that, um, and that would essentially um, let them keep calling that function over and over again until like the pool kind of runs out of money. Um, you can explain or you can find out more if you look up the DAO hack because it's the biggest hack in Ethereum um, and you just type in like the entrancy attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the um, in one chain, the hacker has all the funds that he stole. In the other chain, in the other side of the fork, the hacker doesn't. Because in the other side of the fork, everyone agreed to revert their um, state of the blockchain back to before the hack happened. So does he have uh, the thing is, um, we don't know exactly what the hacker did with the money. Um, because once the hack happened, people started, I mean, the, the interesting thing about like blockchains and why it's not completely anonymous is that you can track addresses down the line and see history of like an address. And so the hacker's address, people are monitoring that so that they know that like this is flagged as a bad person kind of. Um, we don't really know what happened with that hacker, but it's not actually like split in terms of this in this side of the chain, he has 60 million. This person, this this chain, he has 60 million. It's he has no money in this side, in the actual non-classic chain, and the one where he did get away with the money. That's inherently the Ethereum. The Ethereum on that side of the chain is worth inherently like less. I think. Uh, you right there. Uh, the role of an ICO. Um. I will get to that later in the lecture, but the idea is to raise capital for a project. Um, it, it's a it's an alternate form of like capital raising, but it's to raise money for a project before the project has actually started. Yeah. Mm. When you when you have a fork, it's essentially two states of the chain, um, two two states of the blockchain that are identical. Um, if you have if you so technically, if let's say you have like ten Bitcoin on before the before a fork a hard fork, if it forks to fork A, um, you have ten Bitcoins in that side of the fork. You also have ten Bitcoins on the B side of the fork essentially. Um, it's just all the state is replicated to this other fork. Um, in that particular example of the DAO hack, 
they forked it at a time where the hack, uh, the DAO was never hacked. So in a sense, the hacker never got those 120 million. It was like, let's say the, the original balance of the hacker was zero. In this newer chain that's um, reverted, um, he still has zero. Yeah, and those get reverted as well too. And that's why this is a very like controversial kind of topic because um, one, it's in the best interest for the entire community, but it's for certain individuals, maybe they got screwed over because of that. Yeah, this is like, it's hard to actually define whether or not you should hard fork because there's no one person controlling this entire network. Who gets to determine, who gets to like make the calls in the system really? So that's a very difficult question to answer and that's why that's a very controversial topic. Yeah. It's usually the people who are very, I guess, conservative who have like that resonating like libertarian or cypherpunk kind of ideals. Um, in the community now, like the blockchain community now, it's not very skewed towards that population anymore. Um, but there are some people who still kind of believe that I think. Yeah. So, is the difference between a hard fork and this kind of hack? Yeah. But is it only on Cypherpunk or can it exist on other blockchains that are not hacked? Some people do. It's It exists as an, uh, it exists as a cryptocurrency and it has its own like intrinsic value too. It's just that um, so people have differing opinions on Bitcoin Cash and the actual uh, Bitcoin. And um, both of them definitely are valid cryptocurrencies at this point. It's just um, they're, you, you have to view them as separate. OK, OK, I'll move on. Is the, Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move on to the section on enterprise blockchain. So as blockchain kind of becomes more mainstream, um, banks also started to pick up on the technology as well. Um, they took note of what like Bitcoin offered as a digital currency, but they didn't really agree with its like design goals of being completely open, decentralized, and trustless. After all, banks want their users to trust them and also keep all of their accounting and operations private and controllable. And so, so banks kind of looked for a way to apply blockchain technology without having to like replace the US dollar or any sort of currency um, with a cryptocurrency. And so they wanted to find ways to like leverage um, this distributed ledger or like blockchain technology. And so we see like kind of like a movement of an interest in private or permissioned blockchains where the network's not really open it's not completely trustless and it doesn't have like a mining scheme associated with it like in Bitcoin. Um, so in a sense, they kind of wanted to separate the blockchain technology away from Bitcoin. And they, they still take the, um, like the fundamental like cryptographic technology from Bitcoin, like public key cryptography, and they modify it in a way where they can use it in a more compliant and enterprise setting. Um, and so private blockchain initiatives that exist in the space right now include um, like R3's Corda um, chain, which recently merged with uh, Stellar and they're now called Interstellar. Um, JP Morgan's um, Quorum and Juno. Um, and Hyperledger project is basically a, it's an open source um, blockchain project that's run by Digital Asset Holdings and the Linux Foundation. Um, Any questions? Yeah. Um, so as an example, um, JP Morgan, um, they want they want their like blockchain to be like more permissioned um, or like private. 
So they actually forked the entire they forked um, the Ethereum code base to create um, <coughs> Neurum, which has a like a privacy kind of setting to it, where like certain parties can see transactions versus if you're not involved in a like a transaction, you shouldn't be able to see that type of. And they also changed some sort of like the consensus mechanism that happens in that. So instead of using like proof of work or proof of stake, they use something where it's like in a more controlled setting, um, where it's uh, something like Raft, um, which is another distributed um, like consensus protocol that we'll talk about in future lectures. Yeah. They use the they use the technology, but they make assumptions about their network in the sense that it's not open anymore. It's not trustless. There's no inherently malicious actors in their network. Anymore. Um, the one aspect that they're, they're, they're not making it, the way that they can, I guess, um, abstract away the trust is because if you have a more permissioned or private blockchain, um, only people that they verify to join their network can use that, like permissioned blockchains. Yeah, so right now, like the more, more open ones are like Bitcoin and Ethereum because they're not permissioned. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have to assume that the malicious, the, the network is somewhat like adversarial. What is the permission for what? After JP Morgan's um, project is called uh, Quorum. Okay. Yeah. Oh, moving on. And so we can see um, a little bit about how like people in the finance space kind of viewed blockchain over time. Um, so let's take a look specifically at the CEO of uh, JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, commenting on um, the Bitcoin technology. So um, as one of like the mo more influential figures in the finance space, a lot of his opinions can really influence public opinion on like blockchain or Bitcoin, stuff like that. And so starting off in January 14, he states that Bitcoin is a terrible store of value and it can be replicated over and over. And at this point, when he makes this comment, it shows that um, at this point in time, people don't really understand how Bitcoin works because if we learned back in the first lecture, you can't really replicate your Bitcoin over and over again. It shows that he has like him and the public kind of have this misconception on how um, blockchain technology actually works. Um, later on, he starts to, I guess, generate more credibility towards um, blockchain technologies. At a Bitcoin developer conference, he, sta he states that Bitcoin developers are going to try to eat our lunch, and that's fine. That's called competition, and we'll be competing. So he's conceding some sort of legitimacy um, towards um, Bitcoin as a competitor. Um, later on, he states that virtual currency, where it's, called a Bit where it's called a Bitcoin versus a US dollar, that's going to be stopped. No government will actually ever support a virtual currency that doesn't that goes around borders and doesn't have the same controls. It's not going to happen. At this point, it shows kind of um, that maybe banks are feeling feeling a little bit threatened because it's out of the government's control, um, and bankers kind of hate the lack of control too. And so later on, he starts to say. Bitcoin is a fraud that won't end well. If you're stupid enough to buy Bitcoin, you'll pay the price for it one day. Blockchain technology is a technology which is a good technology. We, we actually use it. God bless the blockchain. So at this point, he actually like distinguishes Bitcoin and blockchain, where previously um, maybe he misconstrued the terms, but now he's realizing he he realizes the intrinsic value of using like the blockchain technology. Um, but still having his opinion on that Bitcoin is a fraud. Um, and this is just another set of tweets from, or not, another set of like comments that he made. Uh, I'd fire JP Morgan Trader in a second who traded that. Um, it's against the rules, it's stupid and it's dangerous. So it shows that his like distasteful attitude towards Bitcoin, but not particularly blockchain. Um, and so in January 2018, he states, the blockchain is real. You can have crypto, yen, and dollars, and stuff like that. But Bitcoin, to me, was always what the governments are going to feel about Bitcoin as it gets really big. And I just have different opinion than other people. And so he's basically showing that 
um, blockchain technology is valid or it's a, it's a respectable technology to like to use to believe in but he has a very anti attitude towards Bitcoin specifically and he has his own opinion just as just as valid as anyone else and it shows people's I guess perception of Bitcoin and blockchain over time and so we started on this like really roller coaster ride from the cypherpunk movement all the way to attempts at creating a cryptocurrency uh, digicash and we arrive all the way in like big banks uh, JP Morgan Chase and this is a very interesting journey that um, one would say because one in one sense we're trying to stay away from this like the big bank or centralized govern govern structure um, but we do get to we get the attention of these big banks any questions before I move on we're gonna move pretty quickly yeah Uh, that's actually very like very possible because all these like opens all these like public blockchains have like their code base kind of like released open source to the public, and so if you wanted to, all you have to do is just fork it and make it your own. That's kind of how like Litecoin also developed um, its like its fork or its fork of the blockchain because it's a fork of Bitcoin, but then it changes certain like parameters about like block time and stuff like that, and it. It becomes a completely different kind of um, network. Yeah. And so, where do we see um, like the Bitcoin community? Um, a lot of the conversation happens on like public forums, like r slash Bitcoin, um, like early forums like BitcoinTalk.org. Twitter has a lot of like um, um, blockchain like visionaries or like people who comment on blockchain technology. Um, Slack groups, blockchain at Berkeley. Uh, quick shout out is also one of like we have an org that's dedicated to educating the public about blockchain um, We have like a slack channel that has a lot of members in it that constantly discuss Blockchain related topics and also I mean if you were involved in the ICO hype You probably use like telegram or something which is another form of communication um, And so there's also politics so originally like blockchain technology and Bitcoin kind of arose from this like libertarian kind of movement um, and so it's one of the like aspects that I just want to hit home is that it's just really hard to come to consensus on how to like govern this type of like network because of the fact that there's really no one in charge and so um, it, it's one it's hard to have distributed kind of like governance so a lot of people's opinions also also like play a role in how they view which which technology or which technological change that they should agree on. Any questions? And so a little bit about where we are now. This is going to be a little bit short, but um, so what are ICOs? So this is where a lot of like the this is how, I guess, blockchain, the blockchain space kind of blew up, was with these initial coin offerings. And so uh, they're a way for like new projects to really sell their underlying crypto tokens in exchange for investors' money. So they want to gain um, some sort of capital initially so that they can start working on their project. That's how Ethereum really like got pushed forward because there's no way that a 19-year-old kid without any money would be able to develop some sort of huge project. So that's how the token sale for Ethereum happened and that's how they were that's how they were funded to continue working on their project. And so a lot of other um, projects have emerged in the space, good and bad, um, that have been very successful. And then we also see a huge explosion of altcoins. This is jumping back to our previous slide, but more and more tokens or more and more cryptocurrencies start to emerge as people notice um, one, the, the type of things that you can do 
what aspects of a blockchain you can focus on, such as privacy, um, uh, consensus, like governance, um, a lot of different avenues that you can tackle. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question, right? Um, why would a company go for an ICO rather than any other possible equity capitalism like IPO? Uh, that's a good question. Um, What's the advantages of Yeah, go ahead. Kickstarter? Kickstarter. You can, I feel like for Kickstarter, it's like um, your average person doesn't really know how to invest in a company they might believe in. And so this ICO model would be a great way to make it really accessible to a lot of people who might believe in an idea and want it to just like grow. Like, I have a hundred bucks, but I believe in your company or I believe in what you're trying to build. I need to just like give you a hundred bucks and I get some sort of token. Um, and a lot of the early investors in IPOs are people who actually like were investors themselves, not monetarily, but they believed in the idea, so they would give some money, and they didn't care as much about the equity. Um, and that, I think, mine will say later too, but that becomes a problem later on with the ICO model, because the people buying in don't know enough about um, what they're getting money to, and that's where you see like all of this IPO hyping is really problematic, because you have a lot of people throwing a lot of money into products that aren't feasible, and they don't know enough about it. So that sort of helps answer your question. At the very beginning, there's just no regulation. Now there is, so that's why a lot of projects don't do token sales anymore because of the amount of like legal overhead that they have to deal with. Yeah. Okay. Also, I had another question, right? What's the like proof of ownership that you would own uh, that certain stake in the company, other than the token proof of the government? Token is so that's. I mean, the whole concept of cryptocurrencies is that it, using like a public key and oh no, like a public key and private key pair you can prove that you're the owner of a particular token and like that token like kind of represents like a share in that's in that like crypto projects like network and so you can do um you can you can have that proof via um via that like private key kind of like i cl can claim ownership of that token because i have this private a lot of these ICOs were done on Ethereum because Ethereum was like a platform that you can um, create, like, you can basically write arbitrary like programs on. And so one thing that they would do, they would create tokens on this Ethereum platform that, um, let's say, can be distributed across any number of people. So we're, and also around this time too, like, like last year kind of like crypto kitties is probably like one of the most um like known uh more popular projects of 2017 the idea behind crypto kitties is that each user can purchase collect breed and sell various types of crypto kitties um on this virtual game right um each crypto kitty is unique because of an aspect that they they developed to create these um non-fungible kind of tokens where each crypto kitty is unique and they have different traits they have genomes basically um, each crypto kitty uh, is validated through like their ownership is validated through the blockchain because inherently they're a token and this was really interesting because this actually arrived or this came out of a hackathon project at ETH Waterloo in 2017 and it popularity quickly like skyrocketed um, so much that CryptoKitties was responsible for an all-time high transaction volume in the Ethereum network, congesting the network. This is where people start to notice that blockchains aren't very scalable. Um, blockchains have inherent problems with their network. And because of this like huge craze at the time, um, this, at the, this game 
a lot of more serious transactions kind of were blocked out because people were buying crypto kitties at the time and so we can see that like one there's a downside to this that this game kind of like brought a lot of like network traffic but it also brought uh, ethereum a lot of like attention and a prop a lot of um public awareness on what blockchain is so one of their mission goals was to educate the blockchain uh, lo ed educate the public with blockchain knowledge so that people with seemingly no knowledge about how bitcoin and blockchains work can get involved through a game and kind of learn through that process and so I talked a little bit why like why um, like blockchains aren't scalable, and so that's one of like the main goals that the community is tackling right now. So a lot of the hype for like ICOs, like crypto projects, have kind of like died down. People aren't really focused on um, money making schemes now because of one, there's a huge amount of regulation that you have to like comply with. So people are focusing on how do we actually make blockchains more viable? How do we make it more usable by the general public? And so today, um, a lot of, so we have an example of Lightning. Lightning's trying to bring um, just more scalable aspects to the Bitcoin network. Um, we'll talk about it in a later lecture, but um, Lightning is very important in, uh, in the Bitcoin network to, I guess, facilitate transactions um, and make them happen kind of in this instantaneously and another scaling solution for ethereum is plasma um, a lot of groups of uh, research groups are working on how to design protocols that can um, scale better um, casper is the protocol that that ethereum runs on and there's a lot of work in the space that that people are working on trying to tackle like more apparent problems so that Blockchains can be more, can persist um, into the future. And so um, looking at the broader picture, one of the bigger goals of this course is really to get you to start thinking critically about these blockchain fundamentals um, and more technical aspects about this technology so that you can make your own kind of informed decisions in the space. So any questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't want to comment on it too much because uh, I don't have a great impression about it. But um, maybe I can talk to you after about it. Yeah. Um, so another question would be, how did you enter the space to blockchain and blockchain? Uh, that's a good question, too. Um, right now, the space is in a kind of a weird state where a lot of people are building. Um, they're not focused, per se, on generating revenue i think that's one of um so how did they stay sustainable to be there uh i mean so some either well any if i see on that you are you telling that company is like you get one mission and then you get on the next one and the next one and the next one so ethereum is the company that's the yes. platform is run by the money and yes and also you're the one Did you want to comment on the EOS? Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not for specific comments, um, but if you want a personal opinion, you can ask for that and I'll just send it to you. Okay. That's pretty much it. And we'll transition into um, discussion. Oh, here. Okay. Uh, there's the attendance link slash quiz.